over these last few weeks without now, you've got to have what? Heart. You've got to have heart. We've been talking about having a heart for Jesus and a heart for worship. Last week we talked about having a heart for the Word. And now this week we're going to talk about having a heart for the church. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And I'll invite you to stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ, and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are for your glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be to God. You may be seated, please. <clears throat> Please pray with me. Come now, Lord Jesus, and rescue me from me, and hide me now behind the cross that I might preach you, and you alone. Amen. The church is of God, and will be preserved to the end of time for the conduct of worship and the due administration of God's word and sacraments, the maintenance of Christian fellowship, and discipline, the edification of believers, and the conversion of the world. All of every age and station stand in need of the means of grace which it alone supplies. Some of you will recognize these words as the opening for the order for confirmation and reception of members from the old book of worship of the United Methodist Church. And although we might more often use today the newer ritual, I've always remembered and treasured these words from the old ritual, because at least for me, they represent a very good, if very short way, of talking about the nature and the mission of the church. And again, at least to me, if there's one thing I believe we need to do at every level, from the local congregation, through the denominations, and including the whole church of Jesus Christ, one of the things we need to do is to recapture our understanding of the nature and the mission of the church. <clears throat> Now, it, I want to be clear about what I mean by church. And it's probably easier to begin by saying what I don't mean. When I say church, I'm not talking about the buildings, the facilities, all of the physical assets that we normally associate with the word church. Now, these things are important to be sure, and I'm going to talk about them at another time. But they're only tools for ministry. They're tools to help us to be and to do what God is calling us to be and to do. When I say church, however, what I'm talking about is the people of God. Those who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm talking about those who are gathered under the leadership of Jesus, the Son of God, under his lordship. Those who are committed to the mission and ministry 
that God has given us through Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what I mean when I talk about church. <clears throat> now, over these last few weeks, we've been saying that if we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be more than believers, more than followers, if we're going to be students of Jesus who want to be more like our master, then we've got to have heart. And we've talked about having a heart for Jesus and a heart for worship and a heart for the word. But we want to talk this morning about having a heart for the church. In other words, we want to talk this morning about having a heart for the people of God who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, what does it mean for us to have a heart for the church? What does it mean for us to have a heart for the people of God? This morning I want to suggest three things to you. First, let me suggest to you that a heart for the church recognizes that the church belongs to God. The church belongs to God. Now, we all acknowledge that, don't we? This is yes, this is no. Okay, I see, I see heads nodding, thank you. We all recognize that even though we use the phrases my church or our church, we understand that this is simply a shorthand way of saying the gathering of God's people to which I or we belong. When I'm talking with other preachers, I can speak of my church when what I'm really saying and what I mean is the church to which I've been appointed to serve. We would all acknowledge that ultimately the church doesn't belong to the preacher. The church doesn't really belong to the congregation. The church doesn't belong to the district superintendent or the bishop. The church doesn't belong to the denomination or to any human institution, does it? Ultimately, we all know that the church belongs to God. Because the church is the instrument God has created for the mission and ministry of transforming the world. Through Jesus. Now, if this is truly our understanding of the church, then we realize that the leadership of the church on every level, from the smallest group in any congregation to the whole of the redeemed people of God, the leadership of the church comes from God. It's God who leads us and guides us. It's God who has given us our marching orders to go and make disciples. And it's under God's banner that we go forth to do his work in this world in the power of his Holy Spirit. And that means that we always need to seek not what any human agent, not what any human agency wants us to do, but only what God wants us to do. <clears throat> now, I may be getting in trouble here, but I'm going to risk this. I have to confess that over the last few years, there's been a, a bias growing in me against voting in the church. You're free to disagree with me about this. I won't let that come between us. But it seems to me that when we take a vote in the church, it creates winners and losers. And even though we expect that the losers will fall in line with whatever decision is made, many times they don't or they won't. Sometimes in a meeting, a person will not vote his or her conscience because we like the appearance 
of unanimity, even though in our hearts we're not unanimous. And sometimes the majority will, often in the meeting that takes place after the meeting. You know about that meeting? That's where people get together after the meeting and they discuss what went on in the meeting. Oftentimes in the meeting after the meeting, they will change the decision. Why? Well, we don't want to make anybody mad. Well, I know none of these things ever happens in this church. But it may very well be that even though they are the majority, the majority may be wrong. What the majority decides may not be the will of God. <clears throat> it seems to me that if we're going to follow the leadership of God, we need to discern the will of God. Now what I mean by this is that we need to commit ourselves to asking God to guide us in our decision making. We need to be earnest in prayer and listening for God's guidance. And we need to be honest when we come together to share what we're hearing from God. Now, if God is a God of order, and I believe God is a God of order, then he won't tell one person one thing and someone else another. If we're praying on an issue, and I believe God is a God of order, then he's not going to tell Mike one thing and me something else. If we listen faithfully, we will all eventually hear the same message. Now, I grant you that this process is a little more intensive, it's a little more intentional, and a little more time-consuming. But it works. It works. I heard a story about a congregation that's trying to make a major decision that chose to use this method of discernment, and they decided they would not move forward until they were unanimous in hearing, in what they were hearing from God. <clears throat> so they had a period of prayer. When that period of prayer was over, they came together to share what they were hearing through prayer. And everyone in the congregation, except for one woman, reported hearing the same thing. But they had agreed they would be unanimous, so they went back for another season of prayer. When they came back together to share, a few more had heard something different. And they had another season of prayer, and it took a few more weeks. But eventually, the entire congregation discerned that the will of God was what this one woman had reported in the first gathering. They were unanimous in what they had heard. They were able then to move forward successfully. <clears throat> now again, this is my opinion. You're free to disagree, but, but it seems to me that, that voting leaves us wide open to what we want or don't want, what we like or, or don't like. But as a friend of mine said at the end of a report on a survey he conducted, he wrote, Has it ever occurred to any of us that it's not about what we like or don't like? But if we're faithful to discern, it leads us to the will of God. And a heart for the church recognizes that the church belongs to God, and it follows his leadership and guidance. But a heart for the church also recognizes that the church is a human institution. Someone once said that the church would be a great place if it weren't for the people. But without the people, what would be the point? <clears throat> Yet the human nature of the church means we don't always get it right. In fact, we can mess up royally. In another appointment, I was involved with a building project that had been in discussion in that church for over a decade. Two pastors before me, they had started talking about this. Finally, I said, folks, we either got to put a stick in the ground 
or we got to shut up. And I actually use the words, shut up. When it came time to raise pledges for the project, they finally said, yes, well, you know, we need to do something here. So when it came time for us to raise the pledges for the, pro the project, we thought we had a wonderful program, which immediately fell flat on its face. We did our post-mortem on, on the program, and, and we realized that, that in our haste to put a stick in the ground, we had gotten ahead of God's timing. And it wasn't until we all sought the will of God and agreed that the time was right that we were able to have a successful pledge campaign. In our humanness in that church, we messed up badly. When we sought and followed God's leadership, we were successful. The human nature of the church, brothers and sisters, means that we're going to mess up. But that is not our excuse for not doing the best that we can. When we do mess up, we seek forgiveness for our failures. And we try our very best to align ourselves with the will of God. But recognizing the humanity of the church also means recognizing that we don't always act toward one another as we should. We don't always act as Christians toward one another in the church. Now again, I know this has never happened here, so this may just be irrelevant. <clears throat> but you would think that in the church, we would always be governed by mutual love and respect toward one another. But the truth is that some of the most horrible things I've heard and seen have taken place. Where? Now, I could tell you horror story after horror story after horror story. We don't have time for all those. And it's not necessary. Suffice it to say that we don't always act toward one another as we should. We don't act toward one another as our mamas raised us to act. We don't always act toward one another as Jesus commanded us. You see, Jesus has told us how we're to act toward one another in the church, how we as the church should live with one another. <clears throat> in John's gospel, Jesus says to his disciples as he prepares to leave them, love one another as I have loved you. And how has Jesus loved us? He's loved us with self-sacrificing, self-giving love. He's loved us with a love that puts the needs and concerns of others over one's own. If Jesus put his own needs and concerns ahead of ours, do you think he would have gone to Calvary? Jesus has loved us with a love that has no expectation of return, yet it gives. We have a word for this love. We call it agape. That's the love with which Jesus has loved us. It's the love that Jesus calls us to have for one another. And we, when we recognize how far astray the human nature of the church can lead us, we find ourselves committed more and more to showing that love to one another. So that we can be what Jesus calls us to be. So that we can do what Jesus calls us to do. You see, a heart for the church recognizes the humanity, the human nature of the church, and seeks to overcome it. Finally, a heart for the church recognizes that God has called us to a mission. Our discipline sets out that mission very nicely. 
It says that the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. <clears throat> now, you might be interested to know that way back when they first put that mission statement in the discipline, it said the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The South Georgia delegation to General Conference was instrumental and integral to getting that statement inserted. Now, later on, they added for the transformation of the world. I think it's a good addition. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. In other words, we're called to make not believers, not followers, but students of Jesus who want to be like Jesus. That's our definition of disciple. If we have a heart for the church, then we are committed to that mission. Now, disciple-making has two dimensions, at least. And they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're quite complementary. They go well together. Part of the process of disciple-making is nurturing Christians. Helping one another to grow into the people God is calling each one of us to be. Some of that occurs in the ministry of teaching. And there are people who are gifted for that ministry. Some of it occurs in the ministry of caring, and there are people who are gifted for that ministry. But all of us, all of us are called to encourage one another and to hold one another accountable in love for our growth as Christians. So part of the ministry of disciple-making is found in the internal, work of the church. But the other dimension of disciple-making is external. It lies in the witness of the church in the world. It lies in inviting and drawing people into the church, helping them to grow as Christians, and encouraging and equipping them for the ministries to which God has called them so that then they too can go out and invite and draw others who can invite and draw others and who can invite and draw others and so on and so on. That's part of how disciples are made. That's part of how Jesus grows his church. A heart for the church is committed to that mission and ministry, the mission and ministry of making disciples. So what does it mean to have a heart for the church? It means recognizing that the church belongs to God and that we're called to follow God's leadership. It means recognizing that the church has a human nature and that we work to overcome that humanness. And it means recognizing that the church has a mission, the mission of of disciple making and having a heart for the church means we're committed to that mission and ministry so is this your heart do you have a heart for the church if you do Praise God. If you don't, ask God to give you a heart for the church. After all, you got to have what? Heart. You got to have heart. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is Rescue the Perishing Bill. I don't know that number, but come and lead us, please.